Throughout history, people have asked the question, is there more to our world than just what is perceived with our five senses? Do some persons possess a psychic ability? Do spirits exist as ghosts or in other forms? Is the paranormal fact or fantasy? Well, now, perhaps thanks to the Russians, we are much closer to answering these age-old questions. While most Western scientists scoff at the mention of psychic and paranormal phenomena, in Russia, the study of the paranormal has been taken very seriously, so seriously that it warranted the attention of what was once the most powerful intelligence agency in the world, the KGB. And now, after the demise of the Soviet Union, much of this super-secret information is coming to light, including some astounding revelations known only to the KGB. I'm Roger Moore. Join us as we explore the secret KGB files. The United States and the Soviet Union have been on opposite ideological sides since they battled over Berlin after World War II. This dispute between the two superpowers evolved into the Cold War. An imaginary line now divided the world into two distinct parts. The Soviets on one side, the United States and its allies on the other. There were no concrete battlefields in this new war. Rather, each country proved its strength through the build-up of their nuclear arsenals and advancements in technology. With the arms race in high gear, secret information became a valuable currency in which to trade, and espionage seemed to be the modus operandi. But the Soviets took their intelligence efforts a step further to paranormal espionage. Case in point, the American Embassy in Moscow, a repository of top secret information. But outside those walls, agents of the KGB turned the embassy into a testing ground for new and more subtle forms of espionage. In 1962, a series of strange and unexplained illnesses plagued the embassy staff. Three ambassadors in a row went home sick with cancer, and then many, many of the staff all became very ill, depressed, disoriented, feeling uh, very, very sick, and quite a few of them had to also be recalled because of illness. Naturally, the CIA's suspicions were aroused. Project Pandora, the CIA's investigation into the source of these strange ailments, uncovered what agents called the Moscow Signal. A pulsing beam of microwave energy directed at the embassy from a building just across the street. Investigators were further alarmed to find that the beam was focused directly on the office of the ambassador himself, Walter Stossel. Reports of the ambassador's health indicated that the beam was having a profound physical effect. Despite American protests and attempts to shield the building, this irradiation of the embassy continued. When Nixon and his party were visiting there, apparently they began to have experience all kinds of symptoms of severe depression and crying fit. And it wasn't just one, it was virtually everyone in the, in the group that was visiting. An analysis of the microwave beam revealed frequencies known to affect human behavior. American intelligence agencies recognized the pattern from their own simple experiments performed on animals. But this was something much more advanced. This evidence pointed to a microwave emitter used for the purpose of mind control. As these experiments went on, a network of Soviet spies began to gather information from their contacts inside Western governments. Even the President of the United States was not immune. What was once one of the most feared intelligence agencies in the world was also the largest. At its peak, 
The KGB had literally thousands of operatives working both within the Soviet Union and everywhere else on the planet. The Russian Revolution of October 1917 put a violent end to the monarchy of Tsar Nicholas and ushered in a new era of oppressive Soviet dictators. The man who led the revolution, Vladimir Lenin, rose to power, the first in a long line of iron-fisted dictators. During his reign, the powerful OGPU, or secret police, was formed for the purpose of international espionage. The group of secret police became the infamous KGB. The KGB research into the anomalous phenomena had begun in 1920s, when a special laboratory, so-called dark room, was created. From the middle 1930s, Russian uh, psychics had been persecuted under Stalinist regime. So many went underground. Most uh, had conducted their research, but very quietly. In the late 1920s, Joseph Stalin transformed the country even more by regimenting every aspect of daily life. It goes back to such scientists as Bekhterev and his research, and continues through the Gleb Boki control of the KGB paranormal research right into the Beria's lab. Gleb Boki, who was in charge of the paranormal phenomena for the KGB, was a sinister and cruel person who was known to drink human blood. The KGB had conducted um, psychotronic weapons research on uh, prisoners that were sentenced to die and uh, also political dissidents. Stalin still managed to brutally stomp out his opposition. When Gleb Boki and people who had studied the uh, anomalous phenomena with him in the KGB were executed, in 1937, all of the files were transferred, as far as we know, to the most secret archives of the KGB and later were acquired by Beria. Some of the files were opened by Beria's people and the research took very sinister color. When Stalin died, there was a time of chaos in the Soviet Union. Some files of the paranormal were lost. Some were transferred to the dungeons of the KGB. However, the paranormal research went on. Under Khrushchev, great successes had been achieved in the Soviet Union with the paranormal. Some of the first biogenerators and machines to alter human minds came to the scene. The Americans were worried about Soviet research programs because they knew that the Soviet Union would not use it for peaceful means, that the Soviet Union was there to conquer and to uh, overtake the United States. As the century came to an end, so did the power of the Communist Party. By obtaining top secret KGB files of paranormal research, we are now learning just how far the Soviets went in their research and how they may have used it against their Western adversaries. The microwave bombardment of the US Embassy in Moscow was just one example of the KGB's employment of paranormal tools. But interest in this field dates much further back to an unlikely source. The man who banned the practice of the paranormal and persecuted those who practiced any form of psychic manipulation, Joseph Stalin. In uncovered KGB files, the first name to appear was that of Wolf Messing. Wolf Messing was a fabulous character. He started out in Germany. He then became known as probably the most famous psychic in Europe in the 20s, the 30s. There are a couple famous tests, and one kind of delicious one was he was tested by Einstein and Freud. In an historic meeting, Messing was invited to demonstrate his mental abilities. And as the story goes, they were in Einstein's apartment, and he said, OK, Dr. Freud, send me a telepathic message of what you want me to do. And he thought for a minute, and then he went into the bathroom, opened the cupboard, 
took out some tweezers, went back into the living room and said to Einstein, oh, excuse me, Herr Professor, and plucked a hair out of his mustache. And Freud said that was exactly what he had asked him to do. Massing became quite famous for his psychic abilities. He even went as far as to predict the outbreak of war between the Soviets and the Germans, despite Stalin's infamous non-aggression treaty with the Nazis. He also predicted the end of the war to the month and the death of Germany's Führer. In light of his reputation, people began to take these predictions more seriously, especially the occult-obsessed Adolf Hitler, who put a 200,000 mark bounty on Messing's head. The world-renowned psychic was forced to flee to Russia, where Joseph Stalin himself became interested in the possible military applications of Messing's abilities. But first, Stalin wanted to test Messing for himself. One night when uh, Messing was performing in a little border town, they came and took him to see someone. It turned out to be Stalin. And Stalin gave him two tasks to do. And one was to write, to rob a bank by psychic means. Of course, Messing had no account at the bank. His challenge was to withdraw the money using only his psychic powers of influence over the teller's mind. Messing handed him a blank slip of paper and then mentally willed the teller to withdraw 100,000 rubles. Convinced he was looking at a certified withdrawal form, the teller walked to the safe to retrieve the money. And as Stalin's KGB observer watched, the teller returned with bundles of currency and began handing them over to Messing, totally unaware that his own will was in Messing's control. When the money was safely inside, Messing thanked the teller, shut the case, and calmly walked out of the bank. That was test number one, which he passed. And later, apparently, the teller had a heart attack and Messing felt terrible, but the teller lived. Stalin arranged another test. Messing was to slip past the highly trained soldiers surrounding Stalin's private dacha and drop in on the Soviet leader unannounced. A short while after this challenge was issued, something remarkable occurred. A civilian man, offering no pass or pretext, made his way into the grounds of Stalin's Dhaka. Walking past the first ring of guards, he proceeded toward the building and casually walked inside. The guards did not challenge him. In fact, they stood at a respectful distance as he passed. As he made his way through the Dacher's corridors, the staff offered no resistance. He had nearly made it all the way to Stalin's inner sanctum, where even the servants were veteran secret police officers. Stalin looked up to find the man standing in front of him. Wolf Messing. Stalin demanded to know how it was done. Messing explained that he projected a single thought into the minds of Stalin's guards and staff. I am Beria, the notorious head of the secret police, who none of the guards would ever attempt to stop. He had passed Stalin's test. Stalin was very much interested in, in Wolf Messing's abilities to harness him as a way to control, to find out how he controlled more people, and perhaps to use Wolf Messing to find out what Stalin's uh, henchmen were really thinking or plotting against him. Did Wolf Messing go on to serve Joseph Stalin as a psychic spy? 
Stalin tested Wolf Messing through many ways. You need to understand, most of this information is still classified and locked away in Soviet archives. What we know for certain is that in 1967, Wolf Messing arranged to publish a full account of his life's work. But following an announcement of its publication, the manuscript was quietly buried. After the initial success with psychic tests, the KGB began to take a more active interest in the paranormal, setting up top secret research facilities across the Soviet Union. Behind the walls of these facilities, they conducted classified experiments with individuals of frightening psychic ability. Nino Kuligina, alias Nina Malikalova, was the Soviet Union's preeminent telekinetic medium. Her psychic feats were well documented by these home movies and captured by Russian scientists on the secret films you are about to see. Scientists recorded her blood pressure raising up to 180 beats per minute, approximately 70 points higher than a runner during a race. Startled scientists suggested that in Kuligina's case, the electromagnetic energy normally emitted from the living tissue was greatly amplified. By placing her hands in close proximity to a target object, this energy field was actually able to move it. She was taken to various laboratories throughout so the Soviet Union to be measured, studied, researched, and the KGB was behind it, as far as I know. Intrigued by their initial success with Kuligina, Soviet researchers decided to see what the limits of her powers were. They knew she could affect inanimate objects, but what about living tissue, like a beating heart? On March the 10th, 1970, Soviet researchers decided to put Kuligina to the test. She would attempt to alter the heartbeat of a frog. Simultaneously monitoring Kuligina and the animal's heart, they found that the powerful psychic could actually speed up and slow down its rhythm on. And then, in a disturbing demonstration of her abilities, Kuligina successfully commanded the heart to stop beating. And could such a power be used against human beings? If so, could it be trained as deadly instruments of the KGB? It was a heart attack brought on by continuous mental strain that forced her into retirement. But the Soviets soon found her successor, an heir worthy of Kuligina's psychic crown. Alla Finokrodova, a telekinetic medium who proved herself to be Kuligina's equal in every way. With Kuligina's retirement, Finokrodova became the focus of the KGB's interest in telekinesis. In these films, smuggled out of the Soviet Union by Western researchers, Vinogradova demonstrated her remarkable telekinetic ability. With a wave of her hand, the target object is compelled to move, guided by an invisible force. The object changes direction several times, totally responsive to her will. Researchers working with Vinogradova claim to be able to feel the electrostatic energy field left near the object after she had moved it. Flashlight bulbs placed near the test site would light up briefly, confirming the presence of this energy. The Soviets had their newest telekinetic medium, equally stunning in her abilities as her predecessor, the powerful Kuligina. Uh, the KGB was interested in so-called telekinetic hits actual uh, destruction of enemies to the use of telekinesis, objects within their bodies, enemies' bodies. So definitely the KGB would be interested. How far they had achieved success, I do not know. If the KGB used such psychics to conduct covert assassinations, they kept no records, and autopsies of heart attack victims would not reveal a telekinetic influence. But the prospect of such undetectable psychic warfare does give one pause to think. 
Since their initial experiments with the Moscow signal, the KGB had made significant advances in psychic research. Where before they were totally dependent on microwave technology, their agents could now rely on a new hybrid form of mental manipulation, psychic mind control. Recently, KGB files have come to light, which expose the Soviets' continued fascination with telepathy and other forms of mind control. And it was very prestigious to be a winner and to get all the gold medals at the Olympics and all this sort of thing. So they uh, also went in at uh, chess competitions, and that's one where there's uh, a lot of documented evidence that they did use devices or they used hypnotists to influence the players. Experts in the West worked under the assumption that the KGB would want to keep such advances secret, but it was eventually discovered that the Soviets had a different agenda, putting their paranormal research to use right out in the open for the whole world to witness. Building more bombers, tanks and nuclear missiles wasn't the only goal of the Soviet Union. The Russians intended to fight the Cold War on a purely psychological level as well. The Gaio City, the Philippines, the site of the 1978 World Chess Championship. 27-year-old Anatoly Karpov, the title holder at the time, was pitted against internationally renowned Viktor Korchnoi. Korchnoi, the former Soviet chess champion, had defected to the West in 1976 leaving behind his wife and son. Korchnoi made no secret of the fact that he was planning to use the chess match, which had attracted the attention of the international media, as a public platform to call on the Russians to release his family. One could only imagine how embarrassing this scenario would be for the Soviets if Karpov, Russia's golden boy, was defeated at their national pastime by a former citizen a defector, no less. Normally, the KGB would eliminate Korchnoi before he posed a problem. In other words, he would simply disappear or die under mysterious circumstances, standard operating procedure for the Soviet intelligence network. The KGB had an assassination program, but it uh, covered only individuals who uh, were uh, sentenced to death either in absentia or otherwise, political dissidents, enemies of the Soviet system, uh, former Soviet citizens, they were targeted for assassination. But there was too much attention on Korchnoi. The KGB would have to resort to other methods to ensure Karpov's victory. So there was a team of KGB uh, specialists in the Philippines. They especially were assigned to that chess championship, you know, just to influence Mr. Kochner. And to destroy his ability to win, of course. That was the major goal. The KGB turned to Vladimir Zuka, a well-known Soviet parapsychologist. Although it appeared that Dr. Zuka was a passive observer of the match, Korchnoi himself accused him of being a hypnotist. During the uh, um, game between Korchnoi and Karpov, uh, it, is, it is believed by many Russian researchers that Karpov used psychics on his side to bend Korchnoi's will and to make sure that he loses. Apparently Korchnoi realized it himself because he made a lot of noise about this. Karpov had many Karpov was one of the wonder boys of the Soviet uh, uh, chess scene, and the Soviet Union would uh, pull no brakes to win. And people in the Soviet Union talked quite openly among themselves about uh, psychics being used by Soviets to make sure that uh, Karpov wins. Dr. Zuka had a remarkable effect on Korchnoi right from the beginning of the match. Known for his aggressive and dynamic play, Korchnoi appeared unsure, hesitant. His confidence diminished as the games progressed. 
Egypt. I believe that in his mind, he always uh, used to say, um, well, you are a traitor of the Soviet people. You should stop uh, fight against Kapov. You should stop. You, you must not uh, fight against him. You must lose. Even though he was moved to the rear of the auditorium, Korchnoi still felt the overwhelming influence of Dr. Zukar. The match itself lasted for a record 78 days, 32 full games. In the end, Korchnoi was defeated. When Korchnoi complained to the Soviets, they explained that Zukar was simply studying Korchnoi, observing his body language and passing on advice to Karpov. But was there more to it, more than what the television cameras picked up? Did Zuka, the Soviet's parapsychologist, hold the preeminent chess master's highly trained mind in his grip? Seeking a way to break what had become a global stalemate, the Soviet Union was now looking for any advantage, no matter how small, no matter how exotic, to attain superiority over the United States. Russian scientists believed that unlocking the secrets of the paranormal would provide them with the key that would tilt the scales in their favor. 1962 was a crucial year in the history of Soviet parapsychology and paranormal phenomena. Inel Kulagina came to the scene, so did Professor, uh, Professor Goncharov, the man with no face. KGB research was in full swing. The KGB was continuing to experiment with microwave radiation far beyond using it against the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, as we've already seen. Professor Goncharov is one of the top Russian scientists whose work is completely classified. And he is known as the man with no face because no one has been able to photograph him. Microwaves transmitted at particular frequencies could produce a, a variety of startling results. Such energy had been proven to cancel out the centers for fear and anxiety in the brains of Russian soldiers, turning them into more effective fighters. Goncharov showed two devices used for mind control through acoustic radiation and waves. The effect of such devices is horrible. Test subjects seated inside a microwave field could actually hear buzzing and clicking noises inside their own heads, sounds that could be combined and refined to form words, whole sentences. Commands could be beamed directly into the brain of a willing or unwilling subject. He can basically manipulate any human being into doing whatever Professor Goncharov or any other operator want this being to do. How far could these tests go? For that answer, we have to look a little closer to home. American intelligence most likely knew of the ongoing paranormal research behind the Iron Curtain and were quite afraid. CIA scientists combined subliminal programming and mind-altering drugs, LSD, heroin, and sodium pentothal to prove a fundamental theory. That an unwitting and unknowing individual could be programmed to do the CIA's bidding, potentially even directed to kill without knowing it. But the Soviets had the advantage, merging the use of hypnosis with their microwave projection technology. The Manchurian Candidate, the story of an American soldier brainwashed by the Russians, programmed to perform one assignment, assassinate the President of the United States. At the time, such a scenario seemed far-fetched. But what we have uncovered in the KGB files sheds new light on our own past. I understand the interest of American public to the assassination squad activity in this country. But I cannot separate uh, this activity from general plans of uh, Russian Federation uh, general staff for the future war against America. May the 13th, 1981, Vatican City.
if I understand rightly, you would like to ask me about assassination attempt against uh, Pop. This operation became known, and KGB involvement became known. Mehmet Ali Agka was tried and convicted for the shooting. He was linked to a KGB-backed conspiracy against the Pope. The Soviets were not pleased with John Paul's anti-communist stand in Poland or his support of the trade union, Solidarity. June the 5th, 1968, Robert Kennedy fatally shot in the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. Siran to this day has no memory of the shooting. His journal entries read like automatic writing, what someone would write if in a trance. The KGB was trying to create so-called zombie agents to zombification process. They also were interested in telepathy to find out how they could trigger the, their agents who would be sent to foreign countries without realizing that they were Soviet agents. Some of Siren's supporters believe that he was the victim of mind control, conditioned, directed by person or persons unknown. It's quite possible that uh, agents, that the zombie agents sent in to foreign countries by the Soviet Union were, a, were used uh, to the telepathic um, launching of their mission. Well, all we need to do is look to the history of uh, recent events. The similarities to the Manchurian candidate are far too chilling and more prophetic than a work of fiction. The KGB viewed Kennedy as a tough and very formidable enemy because we knew we could not uh, manipulate him the way we could uh, others. Soviet leaders were afraid of him. America again is feared, America is despised, America is distrusted. Dallas, 1963. you people have been given, but I emphatically deny these charges. Highly protected public figures, also enemies of the Soviet state. A lone man in a crowd, an assassin with a gun, no chance to escape. Quite possible that the Soviet zombie agents were engaged in assassination plots and carried out their missions. We in, the, in Russia, in the USSR, we had highest respect for the President of the United States. We wanted to make a deal with him. We knew he was the man to deal, had a deal with. And that was our message. Frantic, frantic activities of all almost 100 KGB officers, plus uh, more than 100 diplomats, plus some 50 GRU officers. We were all tasked in one mission to impress on the American public, foreign diplomats, whoever, that we had nothing to do with assassination. It's too easy for us to excuse these events away, attribute them to the actions of a single lone maniac. That's easy for us to accept and dismiss. Could Lee Harvey Oswald have been the subject of such mind control experiments? It does not seem that far-fetched. Considering what we now know about Soviet psychotronic and microwave projection research. As the KGB's interest in paranormal experiments grew, the West lagged further and further behind. In fact, at the time of the early Kulaginer experiments, the United States had not yet deemed psychic powers worthy of research. Perhaps the Soviets were predisposed to the potential of psychic powers because their history was steeped in accounts of the paranormal. The Russian people have long believed in the existence of paranormal phenomena. Even before the formation of the Soviet Union, the land was rife with tales of the supernatural. One of the most famous figures to emerge out of Russia's psychic past was Tsar Nicholas's advisor, Grigory Rasputin, the Mad Monk. His insight proved so accurate 
that the Tsar brought him into the royal court as his closest advisor. When the Tsar's sickly son, Alexei, did not respond to medicines of the time, Rasputin treated him with his own psychic powers. After only a short time, the boy began to respond to the monk's radical treatments, dumbfounding doctors in the royal family. Rasputin had found his place at the head of the Russian state. His influence was so strong that the Russian people feared he was using his abilities to control the Tsar's will and seize the reins of power, but not as others had done by force, rather by controlling the Tsar's mind through his own psychic will. But before that could happen, several high-ranking military officers conspired to break Rasputin's spell by having him assassinated. Rasputin exercised great control over the Tsar's family, and naturally people were afraid of him. Uh, we need to state that uh, Rasputin was not a madman, but a very intelligent human being that could exercise tremendous mental powers. Intriguingly, Rasputin's powers may have been linked to another event in Russian paranormal history, the Tunguska incident. Rasputin was in the area of the Tunguska uh, phenomena in 1908. Very few people know about this, but it certainly could have caused an effect on this tremendous and sinister human being. Something rather dramatic happened in a very far away Siberian forest. There was a huge, and I mean huge, explosion. The Soviet Academy of Sciences came out saying it was neither a comet nor a meteor that hit. Whatever exploded over the taiga at that uh, time was equal to 2,000 bombs that were used over Hiroshima, 2,000 times stronger. We know today that it might have been most likely a spaceship. But there is something else that very few people in the West <coughs> realize. Soviet scientists had calculated that if an object were to leave planet Venus to arrive on Earth with the least use of energy, this object would have had to leave Venus on June 30th, 1908, exactly when Tunguska uh, object exploded. It would not be surprising if saucers had crashed in the Soviet Union. I have seen evidence that the intelligence agencies, certainly that the KGB has been interested in collecting data. An entire forest was leveled by the blast. Though it was 37 years before the splitting of the atom, it showed the same characteristics as a blast from an atomic bomb. Whatever this thing was that came hurtling out of the sky made a maneuver before it hit. Nearly 60 years after the mysterious Tunguska incident occurred, there were reports of another crashed UFO in the Soviet Union. Venyamin Vereshagin was an eyewitness to the events surrounding the craft's recovery. Существует свидетельство тому, что осенью 1968 года there is evidence to the fact that in the fall of 1968, there were reportedly a lot of UFO sightings in the area of Sverdlovsk, currently known as Ekaterinburg. On November 27, many residents of Berezovsky Sverdlovsk area observed several fireballs moving across the sky. One of the balls began going rapidly down and after that, there was a loud sound of an explosion. In a few days, the Sverdlovsk paper published an article. This is a copy of the Sverdlovsk newspaper from November 29, 1968. An article on the front page titled, Bebeskovske Dreams, or What Was That? gives the state-sanctioned accounts of what could have been the actual crash. Translated, the Russian copy reads, Five glowing balls of light appeared over the horizon and started to move in the direction of the city. Four of the objects moved in opposite directions while the fifth began to rapidly lose altitude and soon completely disappeared behind the forest terrain. Several seconds after its disappearance, there was a deafening explosion.
With the Soviet Union and the KGB now in ruins, our investigators were able to negotiate for the purchase of four cans of film identified as pertaining to the crash site. What we see now is a small convoy of Soviet troops dispatched to the edge of the Veresievsky forest. And from the camera's position on top of the troop transport, we can clearly make out the remains of a disc-like object which apparently crashed in the trees. Along with the military personnel, the film shows what appears to be a KGB officer directing the salvage operation. Stanton Friedman, an expert in the field of ufology, seemed to think that the presence of the KGB was only logical, given the fact that the recovery of such advanced technology would establish a clear military advantage over the West. Now, I think that film is worth a detailed investigation. People like to think that what's important about flying saucers, if they're real, is that it means man is not alone. Philosophical concept, if you will. From a government viewpoint, that's not what's important. What's important is technology. The first country to duplicate the flying capability of a flying saucer is going to rule the planet. They can fly circles around anything we got flying and make wonderful weapons delivery and defense systems. So the KGB has collected information. I've talked to people who've gone to the Soviet Union who have obtained some of that information. I have met a Soviet cosmonaut and other researchers over there. There's no question they're interested. As intriguing as this footage is, it cannot answer the greatest question of all. Where was this alien craft taken and what became of it? There is speculation that while the government was upholding the Communist Party line, the KGB had established a top secret research facility dedicated to reverse engineering alien spacecraft. Perhaps it was in one of these remote and top secret facilities that the Soviet military began to study their vast pool of evidence from UFO sightings. If so, then it is fair to assume that the Soviets were able to unravel some of the mysteries of these complex alien technologies and apply them to the construction of advanced military weaponry. At the close of the 1950s, American intelligence agencies realized that the USSR had pulled far ahead in the fields of science and technology. Desperate to close the gap, the United States redoubled its efforts in national defense, space exploration, and parapsychology research. With Joseph Stalin's death in 1953, the West inherited a new arch nemesis in the Soviet Union. Nikita Khrushchev, the bellicose Russian premier who slammed the table of the UN and declared that he would bury the United States. After the unnerving discovery of a Soviet missile base in communist Cuba, the two great superpowers edged dangerously close to the brink of war. But the threats did not end there. In 1957, America was startled to learn that the Soviet Union had launched Sputnik into orbit. It was launched on top of an intercontinental missile, one that could just as easily carry an atomic weapon into orbit. But the space race opened a whole new field of experimentation with psychic phenomena. Recently uncovered reports indicate the cosmonauts were trained as psychic senders, able to transmit coded signals back to Earth with their minds. After the Soviets announced that they'd put a man into space, NASA initiated the Mercury and Gemini programs. But it wasn't until the Apollo mission that NASA delved into telepathic communications. NASA's most ambitious experiment involved astronaut Edgar Mitchell. His mission was to send telepathic transmissions from the moon to psychic receivers on Earth.
Mitchell's accuracy in his transmissions far exceeded mere chance. But space was not the only arena in which the two superpowers vied for dominance. When the KGB learned of a secret psychic test done aboard the American nuclear submarine Nautilus, they too were given cause for alarm. The Nautilus was the same submarine that had recently made an historic crossing under the polar ice cap, demonstrating a nuclear submarine's ability to move within striking range of the Soviet Union, virtually undetected. Only one complication remained. The radioed launch command would alert the Soviets of an imminent launch. New reports of psychic tests aboard the Nautilus threatened to make radio communications unnecessary. The Americans had found telepaths capable of receiving messages deep beneath the ocean surface. For the Soviets, it was a nightmare scenario. The American submarine could now attack with no advanced warning. Desperate, the KGB turned to their own long-distance telepathic master, Karl Nikolaev. In experiments such as this, Nikolaev, stationed in Moscow, was able to receive telepathic messages from his partner, Yuri Kamensky, located some 1,500 miles away. Kamensky concentrated on the objects. It was up to Nikolaev to correctly identify these objects using only his telepathic powers. As Kamensky projected the mental images over the vast Russian expanse, Nikolaev correctly identified each and every object. The Russians now had a psychic communication system to counter the American threat. Are you kidding me? After Soviet and American intelligence agencies learned the value of silent, long-range telepathy, work began on a, a sort of reversal of this process, a, a potent form of espionage known as remote viewing. Remote viewing is the alleged ability to perceive places that are remote and out of the reach of senses. This is how the Soviets described it. Housed deep in the Department of Bioinformation of the Popov Institute, Soviet scientists continued their cutting-edge research into psychic phenomena. The KGB began a search across the entire Soviet Union, scouring universities and military recruits for the best, brightest, and most powerful psychics known to man. The best of these psychics were channeled into a research group under the direction of the Soviet military. Special Department Number 8, a top secret group dedicated to military applications of psychic power. During tests of their abilities, the Soviet High Command was astonished to learn that they could see into sensitive government facilities and anticipate troop movements from behind laboratory walls. Scientists theorized that the phenomenon was the result of extremely low frequency waves received in the brain corresponding with the brain's own alpha wave frequency of 10 hertz. Einstein's particle wave theory suggested that subtle traces of information could be transferred to the brain on minute particles within these waves. However, the Soviets learned that they were not the only ones researching this new kind of telepathy. It wasn't long before the KGB came across an obscure publication by a research group attached to Stanford University claiming to have achieved similar results. After seeing this, the KGB knew that the Americans had discovered remote viewing. The KGB was very much interested in the American development in the area of remote viewing because the KGB wanted to overtake Americans. The KGB's reports identified Hal Puthoff and Russell Targ as the leading researchers at the Stanford Research Institute, or SRI. CIA documents captured by the KGB indicate that although impressive, Puthoff and Targ's work was met with skepticism from within the American intelligence community. But an event in May 1978 changed all of that. 
The CIA learned that top secret Soviet Tupolev 22 surveillance craft had crashed on a reconnaissance mission over Zaire. Naturally, the CIA was anxious to recover the craft for study. They employed sophisticated satellites to scour the jungle, but the dense canopy made such tracking impossible. Desperate to beat the Soviets to the crash site, they called in SRI's remote viewers. Sitting in a darkened room in California, Putov's psychic went to work. He was given only a description of the aircraft and the fact that it was lost over Africa. Slipping into a trance, he began to receive images. A jungle canopy, a river, and finally a large submerged object. An aircraft with its tail section protruding above the water. Further viewing sessions revealed distinct turns in the river and topographic features that could be matched to detailed maps. Within days, field agents made their way to the crash site and located the craft. Surprised by the speed of the recovery, President Carter asked how the CIA had done it. He was astonished by the answer. The Soviet government was understandably alarmed by the loss of their top secret aircraft and desperate to learn more about the remote queuing capability of their American counterparts. SRI is Stanford Research Institute, and it was uh, at the time about the second major uh, think tank in the whole of the US. And at that institute, they began the research into the Stargate program. Operation Stargate was the Americans' response to this, the discovery that the Russians and the Chinese were all using psychics to do espionage. All they had to tell them was the coordinates of where the place was. They could then go in and look there examine any uh, files in the drawers and read the letters on the tables and get absolutely reconnaissance level information. The United States government began funding secret projects like Operation Grill Flight and Stargate to penetrate and gather intelligence on Soviet military installations and weapons plants. One of their psychics, codenamed 518, was tasked by the National Security Council to remote view a Soviet facility in the Arctic port of Serovodvinsk. Spy satellites had detected heavy construction around a particular building, but could not determine what was happening inside. 518 sank into his trance and began to search the building. He saw flashes of light from arc welders and a giant double hull under construction, a submarine. The viewer described a long, flat aft deck with missile tubes below, a tall rudder at the tail and a new propulsion system. The craft was larger than any known submarine in the world. The NSC confirmed this report when several months later, the first Soviet Typhoon-class submarine was launched into the White Sea. When President Carter found himself mired in the Iran hostage crisis, he turned again to the remote viewers. Working around the clock, they were able to penetrate the American embassy in Iran and follow the prisoners' movements, as well as their captors, even reporting the mental states of the hostages. A commando raid was organized, but the rescue craft suffered mechanical failures and the operation was aborted. But the remote viewers continued to monitor the hostages until their release. Later, President Reagan would use the same technique to keep track of General Muammar Gaddafi and his army during the war with Libya. The Soviet Union was very much worried about any kind of American spy, spying, certainly involving remote viewing or any other paranormal phenomena. A remote viewer was by far the most perfect spy ever conceived, and the Americans' dominance in the field began to worry the KGB. And the best of these remote viewers was Pat Price. Price is seen here with SRI founder Hal Putov and a CIA scientist. The detail and accuracy of his remote viewing sessions astonished everyone involved with these secret projects. Over the course of his career, 
Kreiss spied on impenetrable Soviet bases and submarines running deep in the oceans. It seemed that there was no barrier his mind could not penetrate, including time. In 1973, Price even perceived the onset of the Israel-Yom Kippur War before it occurred. And perhaps of most concern to the Soviets, he could see into secret missile bases where he kept track of the Soviets' arms increase, pinpointed nuclear missile silos, and found code words. The Russians were forced to find countermeasures to the threat of such detailed reconnaissance. After stopping in a restaurant in Las Vegas, Pat Price complained to a friend that he suspected a man had slipped something into his coffee. That night, Price was found in cardiac arrest, and he was declared dead at the hospital. But that's not the end of this strange episode. An unidentified man with a briefcase full of Price's medical records arrived at the hospital and convinced doctors that no autopsy of Price was necessary, and then neatly disappeared, leaving behind the disturbing question, was Pat Price the victim of a KGB assassination. Now that the KGB had culled decades of rigorous research with the world's leading psychics, they turned their attention towards harnessing this raw PSI energy for military applications. The Vietnam War highlighted the West's concern that communism would continue to spread unchecked across all of Asia. While the Soviets knew they could not become directly involved in an armed conflict, the war added new urgency to the search for military-grade psychics. The Soviets began tests designed to aid the Viet Cong in defeating the American forces. One such test was aimed at guiding VC soldiers through fields of anti-personnel landmines. It was an ideal task for the Soviets' remote viewers. The footage you are about to see has never been viewed before. It is a top-secret Russian operation codenamed G-Hunt. A controlled study probing the abilities of psychics to detect the presence of landmines. The film is believed to have been shot in the Soviet Union in early May 1973. The KGB officers and soldiers wait at the edge of the minefield while this unknown psychic focuses on a map of the field not with his eyes, but with his fingers. Keying in on the negative psi energy that live minds emit, the psychic relays to the ranking KGB officer that he is ready to begin. The soldier takes his place at the edge of the field. It is a nerve-wracking process as real minds dot the field and every step counts. The first order is given and the soldier makes his way into the field. The radio operator receives a command from the psychic. To switch directions, the soldier adjusts and slowly creeps forward. As the soldier continues, the psychic zeroes in on the hot zones, navigating him safely through the field. The radio operator in the field relays the psychic's step-by-step -step instructions. The psychic suddenly senses a mine ahead and has the soldier stop quickly. He directs him to step around the mine, narrowly averting a disaster. Here we can clearly see the partially buried mine. Amazingly, Operation G-Hunt was a success and declassified records indicate that the KGB implemented the program in Vietnam well into 1976. Why was the KGB so interested in helping the North Vietnamese? Was it simply communist solidarity? Reports in the KGB files suggest that once again, their real interest in these dangerous experiments lay in the advancement of their own psychic research programs. Among the Soviet's first experimental subjects were the Chai Gong, an ancient order of Tibetan monks rumored to hold vast psychic powers. We do know that in 1945, when the Soviets came to uh, Berlin, 
and liberated it from Nazis, they also liberated Nazi supernatural archives, studies of the supernatural phenomena that had been going on quite extensively under Hitler. Hitler's obsessions with the occult led the Nazis to conduct experiments with these monks and eventually to use them in battle. We also know that <clears throat> in 1945, Soviets, when fighting in Berlin, encountered Tibetans used by uh, German Nazis for their telepathic abilities to stop Soviet machinery. The so Soviets found hundreds of burned bodies of Tibetan monks in SS uniforms. The monks uh, would rather burn themselves than be uh, captured by Soviet troops. We do not know how much of their knowledge the Soviets took with them, if any. However, Stalin was very much interested in the whole phenomenon. Soon after the war, the KGB began conducting tests of their own with these mysterious monks. During laboratory experiments, Soviet scientists had them focus on a new target, a human skull. After only a few minutes under the intense concentration of the monks, the skull cracked. Whether or not this power was used by the Soviets to turn the tide of the war is unknown. However, this was not the only psychic weapon developed in the Soviet labs. Soviet researchers and psychics continually asserted that a radiant energy field surrounded all living things. And in the case of psychics, that field was simply amplified. However, it wasn't until a Russian scientist made an amazing discovery that researchers were able to see this energy with the naked eye. Semyon Karelian, a Soviet electrical engineer, had developed a means of photographing the energy fields that he believed infused all living things. Karelian photography is photography done with electricity instead of light. And whatever you're going to photograph is put on a plate and then a a high frequency current is run through it and the image that is shown gives an indication of the energy fields around the bodies. Karelian's photographs recorded the astonishingly intricate lattice work of energy which surrounds all of us. It was this revelation that attracted the attention of Soviet authorities. The state wasn't interested in purely scientific advances. They had other things in mind. To test the validity of this new technology, Soviet researchers brought in one of their proven psychics, Alla Vinogradova. These photographs of her hands at rest show a relatively normal aura. But as she channels psychic energy through them, the Karelian photograph clearly shows the change. With such startling photographic evidence, KGB scientists realized that they had found an effective means of identifying potential psi operatives. Is it possible that we're looking at an energy that, until now, only psychics could perceive? Experts believe that these energy auras were composed of many different elements. They could include electromagnetic fields, various types of radiation, or a type of energy that is yet to be classified. One of the most fascinating experiments that they did, starting to work first on trying to diagnose uh, whether uh, wheat crops had been in contaminated or infected and so forth, and they discovered that disease shows up ahead in an energy field around a living thing long before it can ever be detected by any physical means in the actual leaf or, or wheat or whatever itself. Soviet scientists soon learned that humans also showed such energy signatures. If a person starts to get sick, the illness shows well in advance. An unexpected result of these experiments was the discovery that this bioenergy could be manipulated by psychics used to heal the human body. The Soviets had a great, vast, and ongoing interest in psychic healing, and one of the reasons, uh, one of the more benign reasons to study PK is for healing, and that's true anywhere and certainly was true in the Soviet Union. According to Russian healer Alexei Kriratov, a person's biofield changed depending on the physical state of the body. As his hands passed along the patient's body, he could tell at once which organs were diseased. Patients claimed to feel great heat coming from his hands, as if a field of energy were radiating from his fingers. 
It wasn't long before the KGB found a use for such abilities. When the Soviet Union's leaders fell ill, great measures were taken not to appear vulnerable to the West and to colleagues within the Soviet Union who were eager to seize power. To keep order, the KGB called in psychic healers like Krilotov. Ailing Russian leaders like Leonid Brezhnev secretly employed such psychics to maintain their grip on power. The KGB did not limit exploration of the paranormal to that existing within living beings. They also investigated the phenomena of ghosts and spirits. Of course, this study in and of itself is not unique, but the KGB approached it with a different goal in mind. The agency believed that if spirits did indeed exist, it might very well be possible to harness their power for use as a weapon. The Golden Ring is the name given to a loop of ancient towns in an area to the northeast of Moscow. The picturesque beauty of these towns belie their preternatural activity. The KGB's interest in this particular village grew as more and more reports filtered back to Moscow about poltergeist activity. KGB files indicate the first documented poltergeist case was investigated in 1968 in Sustal, a town in the Golden Ring. The Leitmanov family reported nightly visits by a spirit after work had been completed on the chimney of their dacha. I've been around uh, about 12, 13 years old. I, I did hear the noises coming from um, uh, my grandparents' uh, uh, bedroom, which is located upstairs. It uh, made uh, just noises and uh, uh, they blow candles off, and uh, that's about it, so it's uh, harmless stuff. Uh, we knew um, uh, KGB uh, when I investigated, for sure, and uh, my parents reported to KGB. By, by, time, K, uh, by time agents came in, um, this uh, ghost uh, moved from uh, upstairs to living, uh, living room and uh, started to uh, knock out of uh, books from the shelves and uh, uh, also rearrange uh, items on uh, this uh, on top place. KGB came, uh, take the cameras, they try to uh, take pictures uh, of the host. I never saw this picture and um, uh, I just always wondered why this uh, uh, little host uh, wanted by KGB. The Leipmannoff spirit was just the first incident the KGB investigated. But there were others. The footage you're about to see has been locked away in the KGB archives until now. What has been captured on this footage is extraordinary, perhaps a little too extraordinary. The agent who led the investigation into this poltergeist activity agreed to speak under the condition of anonymity. The intimate of spirit meant nothing to us. It was a fact. But uh, we had to investigate. We were looking for a very powerful spirit. And we found one. The Magister's quarters were inside the city walls. He reported poltergeists. We were astounded when we walked in. Immediately, you could sense the presence of some. We wasted no time and set up cameras where the sightings mainly occurred. The first place was the hallway. After five, maybe six weeks, we finally captured something. An image on film. I stayed all those weeks in the guest room. Every night I was awakened by a strange, strange rapping from the desk. Each time I turned on the light, the sounds would stop. So, we set up another camera in this room. It took a few weeks, but the results were quite remarkable, as you can see.
Remarkable indeed. But what did the KGB want with ghosts? The Magistrate's poltergeist derived all its energy from inanimate objects. The writing death to be somehow uh, concentrate with, with this energy spirit. So we postulated that if we could capture that energy, we could use it with psychotronic devices for espionage. After all, nobody believes in ghosts. Are you kidding me? But first we had to train the poltergeist. This was extremely difficult. Each night, I'd place the watch inside the writing desk and ask the spirit to move it to a little table in another part of the room. The experiment went on for months with very little progress. Sometimes the watch was still in the desk in the morning, sometimes in my pillow. This was very, very frustrating. But finally, finally we captured something, something very special. According to this footage, the poltergeist accomplished the task it was asked to perform. Are you kidding me? But how reliable is this footage and the story this former agent tells? Did the KGB want to use the energy from poltergeist for espionage, or was it some elaborate hoax? In any event, the KGB deemed poltergeist too unreliable and unstable and stopped any further research. Are you kidding me? Throughout the Cold War, misleading information was manufactured by both sides. But now the Iron Curtain no longer exists. This propaganda can be seen in its proper perspective. With the decay of communism came great political turbulence in the Soviet Union. Evidence gathered from the KGB files indicates that as conditions worsened, Rival factions within the government began to unleash the most frightening psychic weapons of all, psychotronics. The Berlin Wall, a barrier that insulated the Soviet Union from the rest of the world. Ultra-secret facilities contained behind that wall were developing weapons of incredible power. The infamous Moscow Signal, or microwave energy directed at unsuspecting employees inside the US Embassy, even Richard Nixon, during an official visit to the Soviet Union, was a target of this program. All the details regarding this operation have yet to be uncovered. Nina Kuligana. Directed by her KGB handlers, Kuligana used the power of her mind to control the heartbeat of a frog. And the KGB, in turn, found ways to turn such power against unsuspecting human targets. At first glance, these objects look simple enough, harmless, like children's toys. But we now know that the KGB invested millions of rubles in their testing and development. The discovery of the energy associated with psychic phenomenon will be as important, if not more important, than the discovery of atomic energy. 1963 was an important year in the Soviet paranormal research because this was the year when the man with no face, Professor Grigory Goncharov, began his uh, secret research in one of the KGB laboratories, uh, research for the psychotronics weapons. Just as a common battery stores electricity, these psychotronic generators absorb positive or negative psychic energy. Various uh, psychotronic devices have different effects, and if it was programmed to cause illness, you would start to feel kind of depressed and want to cry for no reason, and you feel anxious. And in some cases, it can even bring on uh, it heart attacks, and that's kind of a reaction if it's a very, very strong type. A psychotronic generator can influence a whole crowd of people. It can affect a person's psyche, memory, or attention span. General Kalugin was one of the best sources of the information about secret KGB programs, and they hated him with passion. They do it even up to this day. They try to smear his name. And when I say they, I mean former KGB officers. 
General Kalugin has done much for the Russian democracy. And because of him, people in the West found out about secret paranormal programs of the KGB to an extent that they never had before. Obviously, the Soviet security services could not stay indifferent to those efforts to produce a new, you know, deadly or whatever mysterious weapon. So they tried to explore the mysteries of uh, human power of other people and uh, simulate a generator of the same kind nature, which produced a similar effect. But uh, as far as I know, the military did produce something of, uh, of that nature, and according to my knowledge, it was very successful. Declassified KGB documents indicate the construction and testing of larger, more powerful psychotronic generators. The KGB and the Soviet government were very much interested in telepathy because it would allow them control over population. Professor Goncharov, the man with no face, revealed back in 1996, then 10 years before, in 1986, the Soviets were ready to launch a satellite. Within five years, uh, a satellite would have on board a psychotronic weapon that would be able to emanate radiation to control a population in the area of 20,000 square kilometers. The U.S. government was afraid of Sputnik not only because uh, the Russians beat them to the space uh, race, but because of ways how the Soviets would use such a satellite. And Americans could easily see Soviets taking such weapons into orbit. But the smallest psychotronic devices, the simplest ones, posed the greatest threat. There are many varied functions for each type, and each one is designed for a specific purpose. And uh, also, probably, depending on uh, uh, the distance at which it could work, you know, some of them can work with any distance. Up until this point, KGB paranormal research has been dependent upon a handful of powerful psychics. But with psychotronic generators, any KGB agent could unleash this psychic power with the push of a button. With the fall of the Berlin Wall and communism, the Soviet Union was on the brink of total collapse. With government security no longer in place, psychotronic generators were now out in the open for anyone to use. In August 1991, hardline communists attempted to regain control of the Russian government. Russia's newly elected president, Boris Yeltsin, stood against the coup. I had a very funny request from a guy who is in charge of a military lab in the Ukraine. And he told me, this guy, that there would be an attempt on Yeltsin's life using a special generator which could damage uh, Mr. Yeltsin's health and, and probably kill him. There are strong rumors that Yeltsin himself was attacked by psychics and psychotronic weapons. Their goal? Trigger a heart attack, possibly even to murder Yeltsin and bring the growing democratic revolution that he inspired to a halt. Psychic healers like Alexei Kriratov came to Yeltsin's defense, acting as bodyguards, safeguarding his health. Ultimately, the coup failed. He is a very sick man, yet he continues to carry on through his illnesses, and every time he is revived. Some people believe that Yeltsin is no longer the person he was back in 1991. Some people believe that Yeltsin is something like a zombie that is being used by people in his circle. A disturbing veil of lawlessness has settled over the former Soviet Union. Under these circumstances, former KGB agents and Soviet scientists are selling secrets on the black market. What was once secret Soviet research now goes to the highest bidder. 
currently in Russia, it's very hard to know what's happened to the psychotronic generators. Our friend Edward Namov had warned about this because he said there was no agreement in any of the arms deals to uh, deal with anything of this in this realm. Ministerstvo Obrane SSR, KGB, the Ministry of Defense, the KGB, and other organizations did build psychotronic generators. I know that over half a billion rubles were spent in developing psychotronic equipment. Which brings up the question, where are all these devices? You're watching Moscow Police surveillance video. Undercover officers are shadowing a suspected mafia soldier. And since Russia has now got so many terrorists and criminals and the mob running things, it's hard to say they might be being sold in black markets anywhere, for use anywhere in various regions to stir trouble or, or do things. It's really hard to know what's going on. From the Russian Mafia to anyone with enough money, it's suspected that the Mafia is working as a conduit a pipeline to known terrorist organizations and states. With these devices leaking out of the former Soviet Union, there is no way to know what the future holds. Even though we have uncovered a great deal of the KGB's information about the paranormal, still we have probably only begun to plumb the depths of the agency's top secret files. We therefore must wonder what else the KGB uncovered, because whatever it is, the Russians still have it in their possession today. And the biggest question of all is how will they use these incredible discoveries in the future? Maybe I'm foolish, maybe I'm blind Thinking I can see through this and see what's behind